ganglia terms, one end of the extreme is do nothing. That's the default condition, is that the basal ganglia is going to suppress all movement. At the other end is not uh, a, a particularly graceful movement. It, at the other end of the spectrum is multitasking, doing multiple things at one time, walking and chewing gum, or being a one-person band where you're you're drumming, you're, you're harmonicking, and you're doing something with your feet. Um, so doing multiple things with different parts of the body, that's the extreme, uh, the other extreme compared to the default of doing nothing. And how do we do that? What the basal ganglia is set up to do is to do one thing at a time. And I think you can appreciate this if you think about, for example, uh, going to a store and you're waiting in line or you're or being checked out and the clerk is scanning various items through the the scanner and somebody comes up and asks that clerk a question and what's the first thing that the clerk does nine times out of ten is that they stop scanning now why do they stop scanning are they going to fall over if they continue to scan is there any biological is there any uh, musculoskeletal reason, reason why they have to stop scanning. No, the reason they stop scanning is because they are limited by their basal ganglia. The basal ganglia pref would prefer to do one thing at a time, to not multitask. And so um, for the same reason that uh, it's, it's difficult to pat one's head and, and rub one's stomach at the same time, I can't do it. I know some of you have practiced and can do it. Um, uh, but for the same reason that that's difficult, it's difficult to scan and talk at the same time. Scan, think, talk. So, um, but, but, but then if you, if that was a goal to be able, if you were paid, for example, to, by, um, the number of scans instead of the, by the hour, then, uh, my guess would be most clerks would start to scan and talk at the same time. They would be able to answer questions and scan at the same time. So it's doable, and how do we do it? How do we overcome the basal ganglia's penchant for doing one thing and only one thing at a time? We, do, we overcome that by chunking. And to give you an example of chunking, I want to show you um, uh, uh, um, an illustration of it from common life, which is how do you type V? So um, if, you're, uh, if, if you type V, one option is to, type, to look for and get the capital T. Look for and get the H. Look for and get the E. The other one is to type the as a word. And it's, a, it's an automatic, uh, it's T-H-E. It goes together. You either get it or you don't. You do the whole thing or you do nothing. Um, another, and, and this concept of chunking, in fact, came from memory, um, from memory studies. So uh, if you're being asked for a number, let's say you're being asked for a phone number. Now, nowadays, a lot of people don't remember phone numbers because they're in, the, in people's phones. But um, back in the day, we remembered phone numbers. And it, every once in a while, you wouldn't remember your phone number until all of a sudden the whole thing came back. It wasn't as though it came back, oh, I, got the, I remember the fifth number, and now I remember the fourth number, and now I remember the eighth number, or the seventh number. Um, you don't get it that way. You get the whole thing. It's a chunk. And to, to another way to, to illustrate that is with so social security numbers, which I think people still remember. Um, I think you all use social security numbers. So social security numbers or, or identity numbers of any type, well, in, in the case of social security, there are, th there are three groupings. There's a group of three, there's a group of two, and there's a group of four. And people will remember it in this cadence, in this way. Um, and so each one of these is, is a chunk, and then the whole number, the sequence of chunks, is, is sort of a super chunk. And what you can see is that by adding chunks onto chunks, by concatenating them, lining them up one after another, you can get complex, more and more complex memories, 
uh, longer numbers, but you can also get more and more complex movements. So if, if I have a chunk that allows me to, uh, to open a door, to rotate a, a knob, and I also have a chunk that allows me to push out a knob, I can put those two together and I can make opening a door a single action. What's the advantage of chunking actions? The advantage is that it can tolerate, if you chunk the action, you can actually tolerate some other cognitive load. So for example, I have chunked and you have chunked walking. I can walk and talk at the same time. I can even, I have also chunked driving. I have dr driven for, um, I guess, 40 years now. So I've driven for 40 years under most normal circumstances. I'm fine driving and I can both drive and change the radio station. I can both drive and talk to the person in the passenger seat. I can, uh, so, so you can add on something to that, uh, to that chunk. So you can, um, and what that chunking does is it enables you to do something besides the chunked activity. Now, what's the advantage? Chunked actions are really fast. They're way faster, just as this is faster than, than hunt and peck typing, chunk typing is way faster. Um, it, it, so that's a, that's a huge advantage. It's going to take much, much less time. It's going to take much less uh, neural circuitry to do it once it's set up. But it's relatively inflexible. Finally, chunks can become so uh, over-practiced that they become what are called habits. And another word for chunks is habits. Um, I, I'm going to use this in, in, a, in a particular way. For the component actions, let's say ad, abducting the, the rotating the hand or pushing open a door, those are going to, I'm going to call those chunks. But the big super chunks that, that amount to um, large uh, actions uh, that have real meaning, um, when those become so practiced that they become outcome independent, those are habits. And so let's just un unpack what that means. What that means is that if I do something and I do it automatically, regardless of the effect, so let's say I wash my hands, but my hands are already washed, they're clean, but I wash my hands anyway, I am doing this regardless of whether there's a need, regardless of what the outcome is. Let's say I eat a grape, and the first grape I eat, it tastes good, and the hundredth grape I eat makes me want to vomit. But if, it's, if it is a habit, I will continue to eat that grape. If it's outcome independent, I will continue to eat that grape. Well, obviously, we're not talking grapes here. We are talking drugs. And so this is why the basal ganglia is of extreme interest to people interested in substance abuse. Because a, a practiced action that originally felt good and was selected can become quite self-destructive, quite counterproductive, no longer producing a good effect. But because it's a habit, it gets done anyway. And so the importance of the basal ganglia in producing the habit of substance abuse is um, an area of great, great interest. Okay, so in the next video, we're gonna look at the uh, circuitry of the basal ganglia.